All right, getting us started today is Robert Engelman. Bob is a noted population expert who joined World Watch in 2007 and became president in 2011. And I'm sorry to be the one to have to tell you that Bob has decided to step down as president and return to his first love, which is research and writing. Luckily for World Watch, Bob will stay connected to the Institute as a senior fellow and will be busy for the next year or so on a project to build an international research network that assesses relationships among gender, population, and the environment, which might be a good theme for a state of the world. Please welcome Robert Engelman. Greetings, and thank you all for being with us. Um, today, we're celebrating, uh, as Tom mentioned, not just the launch of State of the World 2014, um, but the 40th anniversary of the World Watch Institute. A couple of weeks ago, dozens of Lester Brown's friends, admirers, and colleagues joined with him at a dinner to celebrate his 80th birthday. And exactly half of Lester's life ago, he founded a small think tank with the mission of making environmental news and solution-oriented analysis accessible, widely read, and as catalytic as possible. Its target audiences were concerned citizens, students, um, the, the news media, and most importantly, policymakers. You'll find, if you look at our book, that formal, uh, former senior fellow and Earth Day co-founder Dennis Hayes wrote the dedication to Lester that opens this year's State of the World. As Dennis notes, in 1974, solar cells cost 30 times what they cost today, and wind power was used mostly to pump water. Yet the environment was a concept whose time had come, and in its second year, the Institute's five senior staffers gained more coverage in the New York Times, to Lester's delight, than the entire staff of the Brookings uh, Institution, which was right across the street from our old office at that time and for many years afterwards. In its 40th year, and for quite a few years uh, previous to that, World Watch uh, is and has been ranked as among the, th the top three most influential environmental think tanks by the University of Pennsylvania. A selection of book titles gives a sense of how prescient World Watch has been over the years. Last Oasis on Water Scarcity, Power Surge on the Rise of Renewable Energy, Eat Here on Local Food, and how provocative it's been in raising questions. How much is enough? Who will feed China? Always the focus is on what we and the governments who represent us can do, as in the book that first introduced me to the World Watch Institute in 1981, Building a Sustainable Society, which is one of Lester's books. Today, much of our, book, our work goes out on the web, uh, by email and social media. Um, all of these unimagined when Lester founded the Institute in 1974. We now advise governments on how to model low carbon transition and improve their economies, national economies, by tapping locally available, homegrown renewable energy. We still produce our feature vital signs on the global trends that affect our lives. Uh, and of course, we still produce the annual State of the World. This is now the 31st book that we've produced since 1984. We still maintain a gold standard of accuracy, an obsession with sourcing our facts and figures, and a drive to make humanity and the environment a story that will educate and engage the public, as many as people as we can reach, and prompt action. So as president a year ago, I was approached by David Orr, who waved his hand just a moment ago, and you'll hear from him, I think, a couple of times today, um, with an idea about a theme for the state of the world. It's had a theme for the last 10 years or so, or more. And his idea was that it should be on governance and how governance relates to the whole effort to, to achieve global sustainability. This was not a hard call for me. As Dennis Hayes notes, Lester Brown had long recognized governance as the most powerful obstacle to creating a sustainable future. 
And frankly, we're deeper into unsustainability today, 40 years later. Um, not just in this country, but in many others, politics seems to be more hostile to the idea of considering future generations with anything like the attention we devote to the present generation. Four weeks ago, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, comprising of hundreds of the world's top climate scientists and scientists who work on climate-related issues, issued its first report in seven years on global greenhouse emissions and the mitigation that will be required uh, to avoid catastrophic climate change. And these scientists had agreed by consensus with high confidence, and this is the way they characterize their work, high confidence, sort of medium confidence, um, needs more research. They characterize this finding with high confidence that if we go for another 15 years without dramatically reducing, cutting the global total of emissions, we have very little chance of staying within the possibly, hopefully safe, two degrees Celsius window uh, that we shouldn't exceed above the pre-industrial average. Now, 15 years is not a lot of time in a modern civilization like we have today. Uh, that frankly is, is busy drilling and mining and fracking and building ever more infrastructure dependent on the continued use of fossil fuels, which is going to be lasting decades uh, or more. Yet according to Interpress Service, not a single national leader has commented on this IPCC report on whether it has any implications for governance and whether it has any implications for leadership. And in the real world, if you think about it, there are basically 41 people who could probably single-handedly block any global consensus action related to climate change. 34 senators in the United States Senate who can prevent a, a treaty from passing the U.S. Senate, and seven members of the Central Politburo Standing Committee of the Communist Party of China. Climate change isn't even the problem. It's just the most, perhaps the most worrisome, most dramatic, most attention-getting manifestation of the problem, which is really human overuse of almost every important physical and living system that we rely on. National governments have paid lip service to this collision, this, this tension, um, ever since United Nations conferences on, pop, on, uh, on the environment began in 1972. But it's been pretty much lip service, um, as we've seen. And as Ed Berry will be able to tell you, and I hope he'll comment later on in our comment section, he's a State of the World co-author and is with us today. I think he bought six books he was just telling us, so everyone should model his behavior in every way. He's been working at the United Nations to try to get sustainability into the sustainable development goals that are being worked on um, by the United Nations, and it's a tough sell. Um, almost no government in the world is willing to contemplate how economic growth can be rethought and redirected to accommodate equitable human well-being in the context of the realities of a finite planet. Now, just recently, NASA Administrator Charles Bolden proposed at a conference that we raise a few hundred billion dollars and relax radiation standards for astronauts in outer space with the idea that then we may be able to land a human being on Mars in the foreseeable future as part of a crash program to become, in Bolden's words, a multi-planet species. Now, there's one idea. <laughs> and it's actually very encouraging. About the same time this conference happened, astronomers happened to announce the discovery of the first Earth-like planet outside of our solar system. Apparently, it's a Goldilocks planet, just like Earth. Not too hot, not too cold, just right. And only 500 light years away. <laughs> this is so exciting. Sign up right outside the door. But imagine what hundreds of billions of dollars could do, particularly in government investment or in private investment, for the enduring habitability of this Earth. On this Earth, human beings and countless other one-planet species are at considerable risk with no escape route anywhere. Because let's get real about this, there is no place like home. And if we don't get real pretty soon, home will be no place like home. Now, as a writer interested in human population and its relation to all these issues, I've been fascinated 
by the this this fascination or this compulsion among um, I'd say I guess to be kind the more conservative um, analysts and commentators at least in U.S. society who seem to be shocked shocked that at every turn the power of government seems to grow and government extends its reach and its scope. And it, they don't seem to reflect on the fact that some of this at least, probably a lot of it has to do with the fact that every year we grow. There are more of us and our multiplying interactions inevitably require more mediation, regulation, legislation, laws, the, and the exercise of justice. So for example, the more cars we have, the more we need speed limits, we need yield signs, interesting concept, we need traffic courts. The more people there are, the less independence is probably going to be uh, possible, and the more need for cooperation, and frankly, the more need for government. One of the most poignant comments that was made at last year's State of the World launch, and I'm sure some of you were here for that, was the observation by Town Creek Foundation Executive Director Stuart Clark. And Stuart asked the, the group, the audience, is it possible that environmentalists will essentially need to become much more political if we're going to take the drive to become sustainable seriously? That they'll have to engage the public, that they'll have to engage government and be more active about the proper size, form, and role of government. And I think he had a point. I think that probably is the case. Um, I also think that we need to go to the public and more compellingly make the case that we all and all of our children and grandchildren are the losers when governments narrow their concern to present GDP growth above issues like rates of future well-being. At some point in the course of, of political evolution, people started demanding that governments consider the rights of the governed. This was an epical transition in government. And the freshly minted United States, I think with some pride, played a really, um, we can take pride in the fact that uh, the history of the United States, we played a major role in that transition. The challenge today is to generate sufficient public and political demand that governments consider the rights and the well-being of people like non-voters, people in other countries, nature, and future generations affected by the decisions that we make now or don't make. Unless scientists are very much wrong about the way the planet operates, an unimaginable number of future generations are going to be looking back at our generation either with resentment or with gratitude. And it depends on whether we, the people, prudently and successfully govern ourselves. So these are the kinds of tough questions that this book, State of the World 2014, Governing for Sustainability, and its authors address. And it's the kind of questions that the World Watch Institute addresses every day. It's one of the great things about being at World Watch. I was proud beyond world, words to be the president of World Watch for three really great years. And I'm very grateful that World Watch is the kind of place where it was possible for me to tell my board, the board, and the staff um, that after those three years, I was really pining to get back uh, to my own research and writing that I'd been doing most of, of um, my career, as Tom mentioned. Um, and it's been, I think, a smooth transition and a personally very satisfying one. And I'm particularly grateful um, in making this transition that I've had the support of the chair of World Watch's board. Um, that uh, with whom I shared this challenge for three years and who now has been willing to facilitate my transition by essentially taking it on entirely himself. Uh, so please welcome Ed Gork.